join us this morning. And let me just say good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Turn it up. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming. Oh, yes, he is. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. So get ready. coming and he's coming soon so you better get ready <laughs> you may be seated hey good morning welcome to first baptist mesquite nevada what a wonderful day we've got the lord has made today Amen. uh in the seat back in front of you is a connection card if you're a guest with us today we'd like you to fill this out and let us know how you found us here over by the police station and uh if you're a regular attender We'd like, if you've had any changes, we'd love you to fill this out and drop this back with the welcome team back in the welcome center, back in the foyer. <laughs> okay, foyer. Also in the seat back in front of you is a prayer and praise card. Every Wednesday night, Pastor Billy and Leslie host a prayer meeting here uh, at 6 o'clock. We'd love for you to come and join them. On one side is a praise and thanksgiving. On the other side is a prayer request. Give us your prayers. Let us pray with you. Let's, uh, let's conquer what what we know God can do. Okay? Anything else? We have a saying and a doing oh, in this yes, church. Oh, yes, we do have a saying and we a doing. We don't pray, pray before, before we work. work. Prayer, Prayer is, is the work. work. And, and then God, God works. works. Thanks, Amen. Leslie. Having Amen. said that, stand with us. Just 
and two, the, the heavens, heavens proclaim, proclaim the glory, glory of God. God. The skies God display his craftsmanship. craftsmanship. Day, day after day, day they, they continue, continue to speak. speak. Night after, after night, night they, they make, make him known. Him Psalm, Psalm 19, 19 1, one through two. two. You may be seated.
as we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. that says we'll be blessed because we can. Oh, that us. Lord, as we hear your word this morning, I pray that, Father, you would work in our heart and in our lives. Father, that we would come with thoughts only of you. Not of all the things going on around us. Not of what others may think. Not of what it is we like or we don't like. But we come this morning for no other reason than to worship you. And that is through hearing your word as we come into that time, Father. That we hear you speak to us. That our minds are open and our hearts are open. I pray an anointing on Bill as he brings the message. Oh, Lord, touch our hearts. Your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. What a beautiful day today. Amen. Well, uh, if you uh, received your listening guide when you walked in or your bulletin, you will notice that it is full of stuff. And that's why I'm going to... Because I'm going to give you a lot of stuff today, okay? We're on a teaching mission here. And Justin and I, uh, in making the decision to start this series by answering questions that we've been asked or questions that people ask, came up with some questions that we thought we would start off with. Now, we started off last week about, is God real? And if you were here, I hope that you were able to walk away from that message, being able to say to people in your family and in your friends and in your life, say to people, this is why I believe God is real. And you took some of that information with you so that you can reach out to others in your community and in your family. Well, I got an interesting email this week. Now, you may know who I'm talking about here because I'm not going to give any names because quite frankly, I didn't get names. But listen to this. Pastor, uh, far be it from me to question you. <laughs> Don't you love those when they start like that? 
However, I just want you to know that not only me, but I've heard others making commitments about already believing in God and believing in the Bible and don't understand why we are doing such a basic series. We wouldn't be attending if we didn't already believe these things. Okay, all right, I'm all right with that. And this particular person I did call and say, well, okay, explain to me why you believe the Bible's real. Well, it's by faith I believe the Bible's real. Okay, not good enough. Tell me, why do you believe God is real? Well, I've, I've always believed God is real. Okay, not good enough. I want you to be able to answer people who've never met God, who've never read the Bible, who know nothing about what you and I believe. I want you to be able to be equipped because that's Pastor Justin and I's responsibility uh, is clearly stated that we're to equip the saints. So this morning, I'm going to equip you if you're a saint, and I'm going to give you some good information if you're not, okay? So I want you to bear with me. Um, and also, while I'm here, you'll notice the yellow sheet in your bulletin. I, uh, we put this together, and we're also sending, you may have gotten an email already, asking you to do a little survey for us, because Justin and I thought, there's so many questions that we've come up with, but we're not going to be able to do this. The series will go to Easter next year if we do that. So we said, why don't we ask the congregation uh, to tell us what's really on your heart? Of all these questions, if you look on the front and the back, are there any of those that really jump out at you? And I would ask you to do maybe your top three, or if, if there's more than that, do your top five and mark them. And you don't have to sign your name. Just at the end of the service, when you turn in your, your badge to the um, welcome team out there, give them this, will you? So we get a copy of this. And, and if you don't want to fill this out, but you know that you received a survey online, then wait and do that because we'll be getting that information as well. But we really want to know what's on your mind, what's on your heart. What are the questions that we want to address? Because again, if you look at that yellow sheet, you'll see that we have very, very many questions that we could be doing. So with that said, I want to talk to you about something that's very dear to my heart. Uh, I, uh, my first encounter with the Bible took place when I was very young. When I was young, I would have the uh, opportunity and the privilege to go to my granny's house. Uh, you know, I had a grandmother and I had a granny, but my granny was very, very special to me. Uh, my father was killed in World War II, and this, uh, this, this granny was my father's mother, and uh, she kind of adored me and worshipped me in a lot of ways, and so I was extremely spoiled by this particular granny. But every time I went to her house, right next to her chair would be laying open this Bible. And when my granny died, I uh, told the people they wanted to know what I wanted. I said, I only want one thing. I want the Bible that she read. And I will, from time to time, go through and, and look at uh, scripture that she's marked. Here, she marked in Matthew uh, chapter 15. I've read that a few times. She also marked chapter 3 of the book of John. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. She's got that circle. She's got six, seven, eight, and nine circle. And those were scriptures that meant a lot to her. And so I cherish this Bible. And someday um, someone suggested that I could have it rebound. And so Vicki's looking into that right now. Now, the other Bible that I hold on to is a Bible that's very dear to my heart because it is dated June the 17th, 1944. And it's, it's made out to Sergeant and Mrs. Billy J. Stevenson by mother and dad Stevenson. So this was my dad's Bible uh, before he was killed in World War II. So this is a treasure. And some of you have treasures like this of Bibles, but I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that we're getting away from holding the Bible because of so many Bibles online. Now, there's nothing wrong with those. I have all the Bible versions online. I can read the Bible in my cell phone or on my iPad. But there's something about picking up the Bible 
and reading the Bible and making some marks in there that's very, very special to some of us. And nothing wrong with if you're doing it through the uh, iPad. Uh, this is a Bible that I brought in that um, some of you may recognize this Bible. This is a family Bible, and it has the Old and New Testament in it. And in the beginning of these Bibles, if you've had one in your home, they open up with the Bible being presented to someone in the family. Now, I received this Bible somewhere from someone. Even Vicki and I said, we don't know where it came from. It has no markings in it whatsoever, but it's a wonderful family Bible. In fact, you may have seen it laying out in the foyer because I've put it out there for people to see. But some of you have these kind of Bibles. The Bible is very special to us. Why is the Bible special to us? What do, we, what do we know about the Bible, and do we truly believe that the Bible is true? Do we believe that the Bible is God's Word to us? Imagine the power if we know that this book was written by God who created the universe and wrote this Bible, this book, for you and I to be able to communicate forever and ever directly with God through His Word. Think of the power of that. So this morning, I'm going to give you a lot of information. And if you don't want to write it down, that's okay. If you want to come back and, and watch this message online to pick up some of the points, because I'm going to go rather fast, that's okay as well. But I want you to leave today understanding some things about the Bible that you can share, not only with your friends, but with your family members or anyone along the line that would say to you, how can you believe in that book? That book's just a bunch of fables. That book is not really real. And I'm going to give you ammunition this morning to lovingly say back to them, let me tell you just a few of the reasons I believe the Bible is true. Many of you come from backgrounds where the Bible maybe wasn't read much, if at all. So the question I want to answer for you today is probably one that maybe you've asked uh, in your life, and maybe you're asking today, or you've wondered about many times in your life, but, but is, is the Bible true? Who wrote it? When was it written? Is it reliable? Is it historically accurate? That's very important. Or is there a lot of voodoo in it? <laughs> and how do I use it? Okay, so over the years, a lot of information has crept into our culture and onto the internet about the Bible. And I want to warn you, there's some great Bible programs out there, but I want you to limit yourself to ones that we know that are taking the Bible um, and not adding or taking away from it. And I'll give you a couple of those today, and uh, Justin and I have more if you need them. But we want to make sure that you have the correct version. But today, because of the nature of the question, we're going to go over a lot of information, so get ready because I do want you to be able to answer, is the Bible true? Take out your listening guide. We've given you a couple of additional pieces of, uh, uh, of information in there, which I'll go through those as we go through this. But let's start on the listening guide with the first point this morning, that the Bible is flawless. I'm going to make that statement to you because I believe that statement. I believe it with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind. I believe that God wrote the Bible, and it is flawless. Look at Proverbs 30, 5 and 6, where the Bible claims that about itself. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not, listen to this, do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Now, we know that there's a lot of uh, religions out there that have come up with their own version of the Bible. They've printed their own Bible. They've taken some key words out, and they've gone directly against that particular scripture. But when we look at this, we find three statements in that passage that are important to us. The Bible claims to be flawless. It claims that God is a shield for those who run to him. And it warns us about adding to his words. Now, because of time restraints this morning, I'm not going to be able to, to go to all the things I wanted to bring you, but I want to 
work on the first claim today, and that is the, the, why I believe that the Bible is flawless. According to the dictionary, flawless simply means having no defects or faults, especially none that diminish the value of something. Amen? Now, the Bible claims that for itself, and this means that when God spoke to the original writers of the Scripture about what to write, what they wrote down, if we believe in the Bible, and we do, what they wrote down was flawless. Now, I'm going to get into the different translations and the variants uh, a little bit later, but let's start with the foundation that the Bible claims to be flawless. This morning, I'll give you information to help you decide for yourself, but I want to cover, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to cover this morning, and you can make some decisions on your own. So where, where did the Bible come from? Where did the Bible come from? Uh, how is the Bible absolutely unique? People ask that question all the time. How has the Bible been copied and translated? Some of you, if I were to ask you, how did they copy and translate the original manuscript? Some of you go, I don't know. I don't have a clue because that's where I was at until I studied to find out how did the original manuscripts, and there was even questions about the original manuscript, how were they translated over the thousands of years since it was written, and how science and history compare to the Bible. And I was going to go into the prophecy, but we did that uh, just a few weeks ago, right before the Easter services, and uh, we went through the probability and the prophecy, so I'm not going to spend time on that this morning. So my question to you, are you ready? Yes. I hope you are, because we're going to cover a lot. All right, where did the Bible come from? Where did the Bible come from is the first question that we have here. First of all, the Bible was written by 40 authors. Now, you can fill that in on your listening guide because I want you to have this information. It was written by 40 authors over a 1,500-year period in three different continents in three different languages. An unfolding story from beginning to end in complete harmony and continuity. Now, just think about that for just a minute, okay? The Bible, as we know, is 66 books. Those 66 books were written over a 1,500-year period by 40 different writers, but the message is the same from beginning to end. Someone say amen to that. Amen. amen. That's amazing. But we know that because we believe the Bible is flawless. Amen. Together they give a harmonious account of the dealing of God with humanity without contradiction. Now, we've given you in your listening guide a table of contents in case you didn't bring your Bible this morning. And I wanted you to have this table of contents because I want you to realize if you open any Bible to the front of it, you'll be able to find these. And in fact, if you want to see it, there, the pew Bibles in front of you have the table of contents in the front. But as we look at this, I want to draw a couple of things out to you. Uh, first of all, the, uh, it's divided into two major sections. The Old Testament is first, and then the New Testament comes after that, which some scholars on the Old Testament call the Hebrew Bible, out of respect for the original culture, uh, they call it the Hebrew Bible. And the New Testament, uh, the old, let's see, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. The Bible is split with the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want you to understand that because it's so important as you study the Bible to understand the difference there. We have two Completely different sections, two major sections. The Old Testament Hebrew Bible has 39 books. I think you've got to fill in on that. Have 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. The Bible is further divided into types of literature. Uh, both the Old and New Testaments are laid out in three sections. And I think you will find that if you look at the table of contents, you will see how that is written. Turn, the bio, turn it over on the back, 
And you'll see the types of literature, both the old and new, are laid out in three sections. The Old Testament contains history. That's Genesis through Esther. That's on, okay. Wait, am I confusing you already? Okay, I, I, boy, I really am. What? Where's Justin? Is he, I, I may have to pull him up. No. All right. On this sheet of paper is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Contents, table of contents. And what I want you to do is understand how that is broken up or how that is broken down. The Old Testament contains history in Genesis through Esther. That's your first column. That's the history. History has a plot and can be read like a story. Next comes poetry, and that's Job through the Song of Songs. That's the second column you have on the Old Testament. Poetry is more expressive uh, as man thinks and interacts with God. Third, there's prophecy, and that's from Isaiah through Malachi in the Old Testament, okay? Prophecy looks forward at what God says he's going to do for his people. Now, the Jews, including Jesus, often refer to their Bible as the law of Moses, uh, the prophets and the Psalms, reflecting these three sections. So often, just as the law and the prophets, the New Testament, uh, New Testament also, if you'll turn it over, uh, contains history, You'll see that in Matthew through Acts. Again, this history is written in narrative and can be read like a story. A lot of people don't realize that, that you can read parts of the Bible like you're reading a book because it, it's a beautiful story, and you see that both in the Old Testament and the New. Then the New Testament has letters. Now, the letters are from the book of Romans through Jude. Letters are actual physical letters written from leaders in the early church to people living in various cities throughout the world. Now, that's important when we look at that and how the New Testament was written because those letters went out to Christians all over the world. Finally, there's prophecy in the New Testament, and of course, we know that as the book of Revelation. Again, this prophecy is God foretelling what he will do for his people. So the next thing that we want to look at here is who wrote the Old Testament? Who wrote the Old Testament? The earliest written book in the Bible or in the Old Testament is the book of Job. Some scholars believe Job lived as early as 1900 years before Christ, in which case the Bible's authorship actually spans a full 2,000 plus years. Since the last book is believed to have been written between A.D. 40 or A.D. 70 and A.D. 90, most people believe Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, often called the Pentateuch. I don't think I had a fill-in. Yeah, I do have a fill-in on that. So you have two fill-ins on that second part, earliest written book, probably the book of Job, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and they're often called the Pentateuch. These books record the history of the people of Israel around 1,400 years before Christ. Authorship of these books is still debated today, but there's a strong case for why the majority of the content was written by Moses. Moses could not have written the final verses of Deuteronomy uh, as they describe his death and succession. Now, some believe Joshua probably wrote the ending of Deuteronomy as a tribute to his leader, Moses. Moses most likely copied the first 11 chapters of Genesis from a previous source. We don't know what that previous source was. At the very least, the entire book of Genesis would have exited in the oral, or would have existed, not, would have existed in the oral teaching of the Hebrews long before Moses was born. And this was perfectly acceptable and highly guarded so that oral tradition was preserved and the true facts remain. Now, interestingly, uh, something I found during the late 1800s, and this has happened since the Bible was written, but during the late 1800s, skeptics of the Bible claimed that Moses simply could not have written these books. Their reason was they claimed 
that writing wasn't invented until after Moses' death. Now, this caused quite an embarrassment because in 1901, two gentlemen, uh, Jock Morgan and Jean Vincent Scheele, um, excavated the ancient city of Susa and discovered the Code of Mermelaby etched in a stone tablet. I, misspell, I mispronounced that. Ham there you go. Thank you, Justin. Hammurabi. Uh, <laughs> Hammurabi lived in 1795 B.C. Now, and in fact, I think uh, we have a picture up here. Don't know what all that means, but there it is. <laughs> what it means is there was writing long before they claimed that it was writing after Moses' death. Now, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, tells us that the writing of Moses, that they were placed next to the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. I'm not going to go into what that means and what the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies too much, but the Ark of the Covenant was an ornate box-like structure that held a few mementos of what God had done for the people of Israel. And it was placed in the Holy of Holies the most sacred place in the tabernacle. So it was within the original tabernacle. It represented the presence of God among his people. And when the temple was built, the scrolls were then transferred there. Until the time of exile in 586 B.C., all subsequent sacred scriptures were added to that collection in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Just some examples. Joshua deposited his book that bears his name. Samuel wrote on a scroll and deposited it in the box before the Lord. It is likely that Samuel's contributions included the book of Judges and Ruth and most of 1 Samuel. Samuel, the last of Israel's judges and first of the line of prophets, established a school of prophets who carried on his work of recording the history of God's people. Scholars believe that Jeremiah was the prophet who completed the book of Kings, the book of Lamentations, and of course, Jeremiah itself. Ezra, the scribe, compiled the books of Chronicles for the benefit of the Israelites, returning from exile in Babylon, and he co-authored Nehemiah. Now, tradition says that Mordecai, Esther's relative, wrote the book of Esther. And of course, half of the Psalms are attributed to King David. We know that. King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and most of the book of Proverbs. Now, according to the Talmud, that's two ancient books that include Jewish laws and stories. And the historian Josephus, the prophets who wrote their prophecies ended in Nehemiah's day, with the final prophet being Malachi. Thus, the Old Testament was, complete, was completed about 400 years before Christ. I don't know if you know that, but if you go through from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you might ask the question, wait a minute, what happened in those 400 years? It begins what is known as the 400 years of silence. Much of what happened in Israel during this period the period between the conclusion of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament was written down, but there was no authoritative prophets. So the writing of this period do not bear the marks of canonicity. So we have to ask the question, okay, we had a period of 400 years, then who wrote the New Testament? Almost half of the New Testament, 27 books, are letters written from the Apostle Paul as a means to instruct young Christians and young churches, people who did not know what it meant to be a Christian, how they were to live their lives. These letters were written by Paul as a means to instruct them. Paul's close followers, one of Paul's close followers, the Gentile Dr. Luke, wrote Luke and Acts. Five of the books, for John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, were written by the Apostle John, Second, uh, 
Second Peter, of course, was written by Peter, and one of his close followers, Mark, wrote the remaining four books. One was written by the apostle Matthew, two by Jesus' half-brothers, James and Jude. And the book of Hebrew is a sermon preached somewhere in a local church, and we don't know who wrote it. Maybe Paul, maybe Apollos, maybe Priscilla. The New Testament was completed between A.D. 46 and A.D. 90. Now, I've given you a lot of information. And everybody probably, not everybody, some of you are saying, so what, Pastor? So what? Come on. Do I really need to know all this? What does it mean to us? Well, Ephesians 2.20 says that the Christian church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Every book of the Bible was written by a prophet, an apostle, one who had been eyewitness to the risen Christ, or someone with a direct link to one. The authority of the Bible comes from the authority of the prophets and the apostles, backed by the authority of God who inspired them in their writing. So how is the Bible different from every other piece of literature in the world? Not only are the authors credible, but the Bible says that God breathed these words that they wrote down. We find that in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. So these words are from God and are holy. It's important that we understand that God is speaking to us as we read his word. I think we lose sight sometimes of the intimacy of that. When was the last time that you read the Bible and you really felt like God was touching your heart in such a way that God was using his word to say, Bill, it's, it's going to be okay. Bill, I've got this. I know what your future holds. I'm going to take care of this for you. Some of you know what I'm talking about when I say that. As you look at the writings, you will find that many of these writings were written long before they were discovered. Let me see the point I wanted to make on that. If you look at that, and if you look at, and I'll just use the example of the Iliad, the Homer, was written in 900 B.C. The earliest copy that was found was 400 B.C. So that means that it professes to be written back there, but 500 years later, they finally found the first manuscripts or first copies of that. So that was a 500-year time span. And then look at the number of copies, 643. Now, right at the very bottom is the point that I wanted to make to you. And you can look at all these others, study you know, the time span of Plato, 1,200 years, Caesar, 1,000 years. But the New Testament was written from 40 to 100 A.D. 125 years, or 125 A.D. was the earliest copy. The time span was 25 years. And the number of copies of manuscripts that we have today, and I think there's a fill-in for you on that, is 24,000. 24,000. I think that's on the back page. I gave you the fill-in on that. So let me ask the question, who wrote the New Testament? I'll answer the question. The book of Hebrews, oh, I went through that already, so, so let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. How the Bible is absolutely unique is the next point that I want to make, and that's on uh, the back of your listening guide. First, the Bible is unique because of its composition. As I said, it was written over 1,500 years, 40 authors, different backgrounds, three different languages, three continents with continuity and agreement cover to cover. The second is its circulation. It's the single most published book in the history of the world. Single most published book in the history of the world. Bibles have been printed and circulated over the years, and tens of millions continue to be sold and circulated every year. Now, I have followed the um, version Bible online. Craig Groeschel from Life Church in Oklahoma City came up with the version. And every month or so, they post how many people around the world have downloaded the U version, which gives you multiple translations of the Bible, and you can read the Bible on your 
listening or on your iPad or on your cell phone. And it has far, far surpassed, surpassed a billion downloads already of people all over the world. Because it's a free download. People can download it for free. But as I, I thought about this and I thought about the magnitude of the number of Bibles, the billions that have been printed, and the tens of millions continue to be sold, we can't help but think about the fact that they've now put it online. Also, in its translation, it's the single most widely translated book in the world. Even though it's already been translated into more than 1,000 different languages, right now there's an army of full-time translators at work today making it, still, uh, making it available to still more language groups. And their goal is to make sure that every language group in the world has a copy of the Bible in their language. And that will continue on until they feel that every, every language group has a copy. Also, it's durability. It has survived bans. The Bible has been banned, as we know. It survived burnings. It survived ridicule. It survived criticism for centuries. I wonder what's next for the Bible. I wonder when it's going to be attacked again. I keep wondering about that. But yet it lives on. People risk their lives to distribute Bibles where they have been banned because of the tremendous sense of importance of the Bible. Vicki has an aunt and an uncle that traveled to China for a number of years as missionaries. And when you could write them letters and stuff, but you couldn't mention anything about Christ, you couldn't mention anything about the Bible, and they would smuggle in Bibles in their suitcases to be able to give to people in China, but they would have been arrested and put in prison if they would have been caught distributing Bibles in China. And I have no doubt that that continues to go on today. But one of the things about the Bible that really, I believe, impacts all of us is how it affects people. People read books all the time. Uh, you travel on an airline or go to the airport, you see people reading Noah Roberts or James Patterson or my favorite, David Balducci. And people reading all these books and they're reading all these books. And usually when you read one of those books, what do you do with it? You finish it, you throw it on the shelf or you pass it on to a friend or if it's a paperback, you might even throw it away. But I don't believe that people do that with the Bible. When people buy the Bible and read it, they never seem to finish the Bible. Some of you know what I'm talking about because I know some of you that every year you want to read the Bible from beginning to end. And we've got programs that you can do that. But you never put it down because you never finish it. And I, I will speak from my situation of reading it year after year and knowing that I did not see that last year or the year before. Where did that come from in that scripture? I've read that scripture. I've even preached on that scripture, and I never realized until God spoke to me on that reading of what that scripture truly means to me. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. They never, you never get through it. It also alters people's view of the world. It certainly has mine, and many of you would attest to that. It changes our relating patterns. Uh, it, it, it's changed how we relate to people. I've, I've shared with you that we've seen people that are hard-hearted, that have a really hard heart, and we've seen their lives completely transformed when they gave their life to Jesus, spent time in the Bible, and realized there's a different way to relate, to relate to people than what they were. It changes their values and their ethics. And does the world need the Bible? Amen. Does America need the Bible? Amen. It changes their vocabulary. I don't know. You can read that any way that you want. It changes. <laughs> I've heard of people that, that constantly use the Lord's name in vain, and after studying in the Bible for a while, you never heard it come out of their mouth again, and I praise that. It also, and I think this is important, it changes people's view of eternity. I don't know about you, but I always thought that when you die, that's it. They just plug you back in the ground or whatever they do, and it's over. But when you study the Bible, you know this is just the beginning. We're in the training ground right now for what it's going to be like to live in eternity with the Father. It changes our perspective. 
Now, there are very few books that claim to have this kind of effect on people's lives. So whatever you think of the Bible, you got to at least give me this one. The Bible is unique. Amen? The Bible is unique. Now, let's go on to the bigger question. Is the Bible accurate? The Bible was copied over and over and over again from one language to another to another. So how do we really know what it says? How the Bible has been copied and translated? The Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 99% of the Bible was written in Hebrew. The middle section of the book of Daniel and a few books in the a few chapters in the book of Ezra were written in Aramaic because that's when the Israelites were living in Babylon. Aramaic was the trade language used then, and all of the New Testament was written in the Greek, the version of Greek spoken at that time. How the Old Testament and New Testament were preserved. I'm not going to go into all of this, but it's fascinating when you look at how they preserved the Bible and how they translated the Bible in the original manuscripts. And if you study it, you'll study about two different groups of people. The Talmudim, Talmudim, uh, that is plural for Hebrew noun meaning disciples. So there was a group of students or a group of disciples that were called to translate the original trans uh, transcripts. They study not only to learn what their teacher knows, but to become the type of man that their teacher was. Now, this group of students shepherd, shepherded the transmission of the Torah from A.D. 100 to A.D. 500. Now, the synagogue scrolls had to be written on specifically prepared skins of clean animals and fastened with strings taken from clean animals. Each skin had to contain a certain number of columns. Each column had to have between 48 and 60 lines and to be 30 letters wide. Now, see, this is stuff I know you don't care about. This is stuff that you don't know. But I would encourage you, if you're those, one of those that likes all the detail, go study this and see the history and how this was translated because they literally measured by hairs and by threads the distance and the preciseness of the lettering. And the person making the copy had to wash his whole body before beginning and had to be in full Jewish dress. The scribe had to reverently wipe his pen each time he wrote the word God, Elohim, Elohim, and wash his whole body before writing God's covenant name, Yahweh. Clearly, the scribes were meticulous to preserve the original text ac ac original text accuracy. Now, there was another group from 500 A.D. to 900 A.D. They were called the Masoretes, and they were a group of Jewish scribes who helped preserve the text of the Old Testament Scripture and develop notes on the text based on Jewish traditions. I'm not going to go into all of how they did it, but they were extremely meticulous as the first group, the students were meticulous, so was the second group. When a scroll was complete, independent sources counted the number of words and syllables forward, backwards, and from the middle of the text in each direction to make sure that the exact number had been preserved. Proofreading and revision had to be done within 30 days of a completed manuscript. Up to two mistakes on a page could be corrected. Three mistakes on a page condemned the whole manuscript. Incredible stuff. Now, some of you know that prior to 1947, the oldest uh, Hebrew manuscript that we had was from the 9th century. The oldest actual hands-on manuscript that we had to compare the Bible to was from the 9th century. In 1947, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. They enabled us to check the accuracy of our current manuscripts against one that was written 100 years before Christ. And when they compared the 100 B.C. scrolls to the 9th century manuscripts, a 1,000-year gap, they found that 95% the, of the text was identical with only minor variations. 
So preservation, per, per, preservation and transmission of the New Testament text is completely different. When we, when the Jews treated their text as sacred, the early Christians treated their text as if it was the most important information in the world. If a church received a New Testament book or letter, they read it, made themselves careful copies of it, and passed on copies to every church they knew about. And as a result, we have those 24,000 manuscripts I talked about earlier, copies of the New Testament documents. This is, I gave you the list of some of the, the uh, books that were written. I'll, I'll go past that. The, the last part I want to talk about is how science and history compare to the Bible. Many people say the Bible isn't a scientific or historic book, that it's a religious book, it's a theological book. So does it speak reliably on either of the two subjects, either science or history? So let's look at science for just a moment. The Bible is not a science textbook, but it does describe, it does describe how the universe works. It describes how the universe works. Consider the following, and then you can give it a grade to see if it's accurate. For centuries, scientific theory was at odds with the Genesis 1 description of the physical and biological development of the earth. Today's scientists are in substantial agreement with the initial conditions of Genesis 1, as well as with subsequent events and the order in which they occurred. Now, we're going to cover that more over the next few weeks when we take on the question about creation versus evolution. So I'm not going to go into this this morning, but for now, we want to recognize how unlikely it was that Moses, writing 3,400 years ago, could have guessed all of these details about the structure of the universe. In addition to the phenomena I just mentioned, the Bible describes the conservation of mass and energy, the Bible describes the hydraulic cycle of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. The Bible describes gravity in quite great detail. The Bible describes the effect of emotions on physical health. The Bible describes the spread of contagious disease by close contact. Duh. The Bible describes the importance of sanitation to health. <coughs> now, just looking at those six things, what grade would you give a book that could do this that was completed 2,000 years ago? Speaking of that at this moment about history, many people have questioned the Bible's historical accuracy. The, the Old Testament gives frequent references to the people group called the Hittites. For centuries, historians were unable to find a trace of these supposed neighbors of the Israelites. So they concluded that the Hittites never existed. They were a myth cooked up by some biblical authors to make certain points that couldn't be substantiated by actual history, causing the credibility of the Bible to be called into question. However, as would happen and has happened since, in 1906, an archaeological dig confirmed the existence of the Hittite nation. Archaeologists even unearthed the capital city of the Hittites and 40 other cities of its empire. The biblical account was the accurate account. Now, we find in Daniel uh, chapter 5, the Bible references a man named Belshazzar as the king of Babylon. We talked about him over the last series Common historical understanding held that another man was king of Babylon at the time, thus leading skeptics to trumpet that at least that portion of the Bible couldn't be accurate, couldn't have been written in that period of history. Not knowing who the king was was so elementary that obviously whoever put together the book of Daniel was just making stuff up, they said. <laughs> However, 1956... Archaeologists unearthed three stones that contain the inscribed information that solved that problem. 
It seemed that the man who was king of Babylon at that time decided to lead his armies on an extended battle campaign in faraway lands, and so he temporarily installed his son of uh, his son as king in his place. Guess what his son's name was? Belshazzar. I could go on, but I'm not. <laughs> in the last 100 years, scores of Archaeological finds have solved what once seemed to be unexplainable contradictions between the historical account and the biblical record. And the last thing I put on your listening guide was archaeologist Nelson Gluck said it may be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. You get the importance of that? They're doing archaeological finds today with microscopes that take, can take them to places they never could go before for authenticity. And they're finding more and more and more, which we'll be bringing some of those over the, the next few weeks to kind of let you know. But there's so much of it. Finally, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence of the truth of the Bible is uncanny track record of fulfilled prophecies excuse me, which we covered before Easter. I wish we had time to tackle four or five more, but we don't. For the sake of time, let's just look at the one. That I'll remind you of one that we talked about before the predictions that all were written down in the Bible between 1,400 and 400 years before Jesus was born. These prophecies were incredibly detailed, like what city he would be born in, what family he would be born in, his manner of birth, how he would live, how he would die, how he would rise again. All told, there were 332 prophecies written about the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. And if you want to find out more about that, if you go back to a couple of messages online before Easter, you'll find that we... Uh, Justin and I talked about that, the, particularly the 24 prophecies written in Isaiah because we were studying getting information from a man named Peter Stoner who had, did the mat, who had put together the mathical, mathematical probability of one man being able to fulfill eight of those prophecies. And what we found at that time, he concluded mathematically that for one person to fulfill eight prophecies, it would be one in ten in the 17th power. That's what it looks like. That's for eight. Jesus fulfilled 322. So let me give you the bottom line. I've probably confused you a little bit. I've confused myself. <laughs> I hope the second service I'm able to keep it a little bit straighter. <laughs> Thank you. I need that, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> the only way that anyone is ever going to come to an honest conclusion of whether or not the Bible is true, whether the Bible is accurate, is to simply read it. You need to read it. If you're not reading the Bible, I want to encourage you today to find five minutes every day to be able to read God's Word. Even if you're like me, and at one point you couldn't figure out on what page this particular book was, and for many years, and still do every once in a while, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I'll go to find a book in the Bible, and I can't remember where it was. I'll look over the table of contents. Oh, yeah, page 400. Yeah. Still happens to me, and I'm sure that it happens to some of you. But if you'll take the time to do that, you'll discover that the Bible truly is a wonderful book. But you know what you'll find when you read the Bible, if you'll take the time to do that? If you'll take the time to spend time with God's Word and read His Word, that Word will read you. That Word, His Word will read you. It speaks to you about who you really are who you should be, maybe even who you want to be, but more importantly, who you can be by having a relationship with God. 
The evidence is so persuasive. And we're going to start next week looking at some other questions. One of the things that we're going to look at maybe next week, we are going to have baptisms next week. We were looking at going towards um, do all roads lead to heaven? We may change our mind on that based on your filling out these questions that you're going to fill out and answer for us. We really want to know what's on your heart, what's on your mind. Justin and I want to be able to come to you with the answers you need to equip you to be able to share the love of Jesus Christ with as many people as you can. Folks, I don't ever remember a time in my life uh, when we've been in trouble like we are today. People need the Lord. Say it with me. People need the Lord. Now, you know we're going to go out singing that song today, but before we do that, I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you, and I hope that uh, you were able to take some information away about the Bible where you're starting to feel a little more comfortable with the fact that maybe it is true, maybe it is accurate, maybe now you know how we come to have the Bible. Bow your heads with me. Father, as we close this time together today, I thank you for the opportunity to try to expand a little bit on your, your word. I know that we, we didn't add to it or take away from it, but we tried to explain it. And I pray that, Lord, that we explained it, uh, or I explained it in a way this morning that people have new uh, found love for your word, that they understand the magnitude and understand how important it is for them to open their Bibles and open and, and read your word because you want to you want to speak to them. You want to touch their hearts. You want to touch their lives. Father, if you've brought somebody here today that's never made a commitment to you, they've never stepped across that line, I want to ask that as they pray this simple prayer that you touch their hearts in such a way that they know without a doubt that it's you. I want you to pray something like this. If you've never given your heart to the Lord, you might say, God, I know that I've not lived my life the way that you want me to. And I so want to change that. I do believe that you sent your son to die on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven. And though I don't understand it all, by faith this morning, I want to open my heart and my life to you from this day forward. Maybe you've come back and you've been away from the Lord for a while and God's brought you home. You might say, thank you, Lord, for bringing me back to center, bringing me back to what's important in my life, bringing me back to that relationship with you. And I pray all of this this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward. Don't forget to turn in your yellow sheets along with your praise and prayer cards. And if you're a guest with us, thank you for coming this morning and sharing this time with us. Please fill out the green card. Let us know how you found us. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. Open door. People need.